Why is sequencing more important than trying to say everything at the same time? Let's take a look at your brain right now and what it's doing. And what the brains of everybody in the audience as you do presentations for are doing while you're doing the presentation. And we got six minutes left to get this done. How about that? <clears throat> the brain. The researchers identified three portions of your brain which you use when you're sitting in a presentation in the audience. They use the word memory to describe each of these functions, even though in everyday life we wouldn't call them memory. But they want to have the same term to use when we're talking about these different functions. Your job, when you're doing a presentation, is to deliver in such a way, the information in such a way, that you're helping the audience to manage these three functions correctly. For those of you who are engineers, this is the biomechanics of it. And presentation skills and rhetorical skills are what you use to do that. Let me, let me show you how this works. Step one, sense memory. As you're sitting there, your senses are taking in all kinds of information. Maybe one of your shoes is too tight. Maybe you feel it loosened up. You feel the chair. There's background noise. There's a humming of an air conditioner. There's all these different things to see. Most of this stuff just washes out. It doesn't even stay. Presentation skills, what you do with your voice, with movement, with gestures, with pictures, is how you help get the audience's attention focused here. This is what we want you to pay attention to. And it makes it easier for them, rather than you in the audience having to block out all this stuff, if you create enough activity going on up here in a focused way, then all the audience has to do is go with you. It's leadership. What you do focus on then becomes the focus of your short-term memory, or what can also be called attention. So what you're aware of right now is taking place here in your short-term memory, in the region of your brain, which is known as the hypothalamus. It's the most, one of the most primitive parts of the brain. It's like when you're in the jungle, you've got to know everything that's going on right now to survive. If you're not thinking about the present you're going to get for Aunt Matilda next Christmas. Then, no, that's, you don't do that in the jungle. That's in another part of the brain. Now, every five to 20 seconds, this short-term memory wraps up what it just received in a little packet, which the researchers call a chunk, and it sends it up here to the cerebral cortex, where you have long-term memory, and where you have other more advanced brain functions like compassion, understanding, sympathy, wisdom. Now, if the brain thinks you're still talking about this, the same thing is still going on, it will pull that packet back out. So if you're focused on the fact that we're talking about how the brain functions during a presentation, you, you've created this chunk which is how the brain functions during a presentation. And you keep sending it up and back and adding on to it every 5 to 20 seconds until you know that chunk is over. And then you create a new chunk and keep sending that up. Rhetorical skills, how you organize the different sections of your presentation, or how you help the audience do this. How they know, well, this is one big chunk, now it's done. And being very clear when you begin the next section of your presentation, that helps the audience know as clearly and distinctly as possible what the new chunk is. And the more the chunks are separate and clearly defined, the easier it is for the brain to store them and to retrieve them later on. So if I've done my job with this chunk about how the brain functions, an hour from now, or tomorrow, or a week from now, some of you will actually remember, oh, there were these three parts of the brain. There's the part taking in the the sensory data, and then there's my attention, and then there's a longer term thing, and I can use presentation skills to help manage that. If you remember that level of detail, I'm happy. You say? <laughs> so, this is what's going on in the present. Now, there's a critical question that comes on up there about this short term memory, since we're working in time. And that question is how much? How much can the audience take in? Right here and now. And they have an answer. These scientific researchers, they're very clinical. They call this the magic number. Here's my version of the magic number. Five. 
A researcher in the 1950s, George Miller, came up with the magic number seven, plus or minus two, working with acoustic tones. How many acoustic tones people could take in in a short space of time and then remember the sequence. Uh, another researcher named Nelson Cohen, doing more advanced research in the 1990s, said, well, what if, what if we're talking about not musical tones, but ideas and things? He came up with the number four, plus or minus one. Four plus one, seven minus two is five. So I give you five. That means if you have a PowerPoint slide up, ideally you don't want to have more than five items in that slide. If you have more than five items in that slide, and many people do, they put up these complicated slides, here's what happens to the hypothalamus. It sees a slide and it's overloaded. And then it sees the next slide, it's overloaded. The next slide, it's overloaded. And what do people start doing? They get distracted, they fall asleep. Why? The brain will not stay in cerebral discomfort. It's not masochistic. It goes away from overload. Haven't you ever been in a lecture where you were really interested in the subject, but you couldn't keep awake? Yeah, it wasn't the content. The guy wasn't managing your hypothalamus well. We kept overloading it, so you just went on. It went on. You had to fight against it. Now, there was a point in time when presentation skills trainers used to say, now, the magic number is seven. They had never read Miller, but they heard the seven because that was the number that came out of the 50s, they'd say, so you can have seven bullet points with seven words in a line. There you go. That describes a lot of slides, people, that you see, doesn't it? Does that solve the problem? Will that not overload the brain? Let's do one more brief exercise, okay? I'm going to show you a picture and ask you to look at it, all right? Are you all looking at the picture? If you're looking at the picture right now, you can see that it's sunset. Please raise your hand. There you go. Now, at least some of you were able to take in this picture and follow instructions telling you to raise your hand, which tells me that you can do this. Here, let me show you the chart of the brain. This is the chart of the brain. It, it reflects the research of Roger Sperry, who won the Nobel Prize in 1952, for discovering that the left side of the brain is primarily oral, and the right side of the brain is primarily visual. What we just showed was that you can see a simple image and analyze what you hear at the same time. It's not an overload. Okay. So long as those two things are simple. Now let me show you some literature. This is a paragraph on the subject of right brain function. I ask you to read it and I'll talk to you at the same time. Now, the interesting thing about presentation skills is that it has been discovered that they stimulate the right side of the brain, even though many of them are vocal. Okay. So you, now, what we've just demonstrated is that the brain cannot analyze what it's hearing and what you're reading at the same time. This is the side of the brain which analyzes great words in time, one after another, and uses logic to figure out what they mean. That analytical part of the brain can only analyze one thing at a time. So if you put up a slide with five bullet points and five words in each one, and then you're standing here and talking at the same time, you're overloading the left side of the brain, and it will unhook eventually. Or people will get confused jumping up and back between the two. 